The city of Pittsburgh began centuries ago with Native American civilizations in what is now the modern Pittsburgh region. Ultimately, French and British explorers come across the strategic junction where the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers meet to form the Ohio. The area later became a battleground when France and Britain fought for control in the 1750s. Once America gained its independence in 1783, the village around Fort Pitt continued to grow. Through the region, they saw the short-lived Whiskey Rebellion as well as the War of 1812 cutting off the supply of British goods. This in turn stimulated American manufacturers. By 1815, Pittsburgh was producing large quantities of iron, brass, tin, and glass products. By the 1840s, Pittsburgh had grown to one of the largest cities west of the Allegheny Mountains. Pittsburgh's production of steel began in 1875, and by 1911, they were producing half the nation's steel. Following World War II, Pittsburgh launched a clean air and civic revitalization project known as the Renaissance. The industrial base continued to expand through the 1960s, but in 1970, foreign competition led to the collapse of the steel industry with massive layoffs and mill closures. Top corporate headquarters moved out in the 1980s. Today, the population of Pittsburgh metropolitan area is holding steady at 2.4 million and is 65% white. Renaissance began in Pittsburgh in 1946, with civic leaders Mayor David L. Lawrence elected in 1945, Richard K. Mellon, chairman of Mellon Bank, and John P. Robin, whom all began smoke control and urban revitalization. This age of Renaissance was possible through Title I of the Housing Act of 1949. By 1950, massive bands of buildings and land near the point were demolished for the Gateway Center. 1953 saw the opening of the Greater Pittsburgh Municipal Airport Terminal. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, the Lower Hill District, an area populated predominantly by people of African descent, was completely destroyed. Ninety-five acres of the Lower Hill District were cleared using eminent domain, forcibly displacing hundreds of small businesses and more than 8,000 people to make room for a cultural center that included the Civic Arena, which opened in 1961. Other than one apartment building, none of the other buildings planned for the cultural center were ever built. The Hill District was home to many people. It was one of Pittsburgh's last great immigrant melting pots. Italian grocers lived and worked among black barbers, Syrian bakers, and Jewish butchers. Schools and stores were integrated, and many businesses hired cross-culturally. However, at first sight, you would never realize that. The housing, infrastructure, and sanitary conditions were awful. People lived in boarding houses and hotels. Some people lived above stores, while others in standalone homes and apartment buildings. Yet sanitation was not the neighborhood's only problem. Vice was rampant with outbursts of violence. Yet former residents still remember the strong family support systems and help when they ran short of money. They remember feeling safe. However, the city did not feel the same way as the residents. In 1947, the Pittsburgh Regional Planning Association developed a plan for a $15 million Pittsburgh Center, a combination sports arena, auditorium, and industrial exhibit hall. Surrounding the center was to be a hotel and apartment house structures of the most modern design. After arriving at Pennsylvania Station, you will be able to get on a moving stairway, which would take you up the hill flanking Bigelow Boulevard. At the top of the hill, you would enter a big hotel and register for the duration of the convention. After checking in, you would go to the center itself through a tunnel. There, you would find a great auditorium shaped like a covered bowl on the side with seats for 18,000 people. In a wing facing the Golden Triangle, you would find various committees meeting in rooms with a large preliminary gathering in a small auditorium. Walking out onto a broad plaza, you would find a panoramic view of the city. Looking back at the main building, you would notice that its exterior was something like a drum. On its flat roof, a helicopter pad would be found. Around and about the center, you would see bright new buildings, mostly apartment structures in a park-like settings. Pittsburgh had redeveloped almost the entire Lower Hill District, 70 acres in all, while building the center. Later on, you would go to the big restaurant in a second wing attached to the auditorium building. On the upper side, there you may get served on a terrace overlooking much of Pittsburgh. In the same wing would be a theater seating 1,250 people, where you might catch a Broadway show. The association gave the plan to the Chamber of Commerce in the hope that they would carry the ball from there but the chamber apparently took a quick glance at the price tag and fumbled. However, some civil leaders refused to be discouraged. 
As they were thinking of a new development for the hill, they were inspired by the fabulous fairyland that Frank Lloyd Wright proposed for Point Park. Though nobody knows what it would have cost, it would have been in the excess of $200 million. In 1952, civil planners realized that they must file blueprints and specifications for the redevelopment plan by the end of the year in order to obtain federal aid. In 1953, on February 8th, David L. Lawrence publicly announced plans for the new Civic Center. After his public announcement, David L. Lawrence went to Mr. Kaufman to propose the new plans of the project to get his support which probably meant a million dollars in cash for the project. These new plans, drawn up by Mitchell and Ritchie, consisted of 106 acres of blighted property with a huge municipal arena seating 16,750 people, seating for 8,500 at the Operetta, 14,000 for hockey, basketball, and ice shows, and up to 16,750 for boxing, wrestling, conventions, and public meetings. However, Financing this new development was a huge problem with the estimated cost being at $50 million. In 1955, after thousands of pages of plans, 30 maps, and hundreds of conferences, federal approval of the Lower Hill Redevelopment Project was accepted. The cost of the Civil Center Project will be around $21 million. About $9 million will be obtained through the sale of land to redevelopers, which leaves $12 million to be raised. Although the government will give $8 million and the state will donate another million and the city will pay $1,750,000, which leaves $1,250,000, which is the amount of property the three taxing bodies, the city, the county, and Pittsburgh Board of Education agreed to gift for the redevelopment project. The Civil Center project was officially under construction as of May 31, 1956 with the demolition of the first of 1,300 homes. As of January 9, 1957, 95 acres of the Lower Hill were demolished in, with the intent of raising 266 more buildings equivalent to the 20 acres by January 22, 1957. By 1960, all of the demolition necessary for the Civil Center was completed. The $22 million arena, which would be equivalent to $175 million today, was finally finished in 1961. The final design for the domed roof was supported by a 260-foot arch, which allowed it free of internal support, leaving no obstruction for the seats within. The roof had a total diameter of 415 feet, which was divided into eight different sections. Six of the eight sections could all fold to fit underneath two sections in two and a half minutes, making the arena the world's first major indoor sports stadium with a retractable roof. A total of 42 trucks were needed to support and move the six movable sections. Another notable engineering feature for this arena is a system that raises a block of 2,100 seats into the air to create a 118 by 64 foot stage for the light opera musical comedy, and other forms of entertainment. When sporting events took place, the seats were lowered into the amphitheater arrangement. Although the Civil Center was already open on September 16, 1962, the Silver Dome structure in the Lower Hill was officially renamed the Civil Arena. Originally, it was named the Civil Auditorium, but Public Auditorium Authority had decided to change it. Once the arena was finished, so was the redevelopment project in the Lower Hill. There was a paper plan for redeveloping the whole area which consisted of Crawford Street becoming a wide boulevard and an art center that would sit across from Washington Plaza Apartments at Center and Wiley Avenues. Across from Crawford Street would be a park with a driveway arching in a giant semicircle in and out of it. Beyond that park would be housing, mostly duplexes and townhomes. Yet this was never built. John Morrow, director of City Planning Commission, talked about the Lower Hill project and said nothing can be accomplished anywhere in the Lower Hill District because there is too much dialogue and not enough decisions. The execution of urban renewal plans in Pittsburgh, more specifically the Lower Hill District, proves the necessity of strong architectural planning and the follow-through to accomplish a successful redevelopment project. As seen through this case study of the Lower Hill, we see the importance of planning, execution, as well as project funds and local needs in order to achieve a positive urban revival.